Okay, great. Um, so last time we talked about uh, this functor, this definabilization functor, which goes from algebraic spaces, algebraic objects in general, to these definable analytic spaces. which will denote by a def, definabilization. And uh, we want to say something about this functor to the extent of generalizing um, the definable Chow theorem to cases which allow for no potence. <clears throat> so the result I want to talk about, <clears throat> which we sort of call the own minimal Gaga principle following um, Sarah's paper and work <clears throat> is the following. So consider the functor from coherent sheaves on X to coherent sheaves on the definabilization of X. There are two important properties that this satisfies. The first are that it's exact and fully faithful. So exact, we already talked about, it preserves exact sequences. <clears throat> and fully faithful means that maps between two um, algebraic coherent sheaves not only inject, but are actually the same as maps between their definabilizations. So for example, if we take F to just be the structure sheaf, this says that uh, global sections for a coherent sheaf is the same as global sections for definabilization. So it's sort of like a generalization of the statement that if you take a global definable holomorphic function on an algebraic variety, it has to be algebraic. This is a more general uh, form of that. <clears throat> and the second statement is a little bit tricky. So it would be nice if this was an actual um, equivalence of categories. So everything here came from something here and math behaved the same way. That's not true. It's true if X is compact, but it's not true in this case. What is true is something a little bit more complicated. The central image is closed undertaking sub-objects and quotients. In other words, if you have an, uh, a definable sheaf which is algebraizable, it comes from an algebraic coherent sheaf definabilized, and you take any sub-object or quotient of it, um, or sub-quotient, then that's also algebraic. So once you already are within the algebraic world, you can't leave it. It's very hard to leave, but there are things that aren't algebraic. Um, just to give an example, I'll stay away from this board because the height keeps confusing me and there's plenty of boards here. Um, just to give an example, to show the def is not surjective, So I may have talked about this example earlier in some form. Let me talk about it in slightly more detail. <clears throat> so take lambda to be um, a complex number and take x to just be gm definabilized. So x is just c star with its usual 
um, definable structure. Nothing complicated going on here. You can make actually a definable C local system V lambda on X. Just by declaring that if you go around the loop, you multiply um, by uh, e to the lambda. <clears throat> so um, in the following way, so we have uh, C star here. This is x going around the loop. So V lambda is one dimensional. And going around the loop multiplies you by, um, how do I normalize this properly? Let me normalize it by say, you multiply it by e to the two pi i lambda. I don't know why I wrote this so small. I have space. Okay, so I can set this up in various ways. Just take a, a cover by two sort of big arcs, take a trivial local system on each of them, and then glue using this map. So this is a local system on the definable site. Um, of x. You can't do this kind of thing algebraically. This is not a coherent sheaf yet. It's a local system, though. And then to make it a coherent sheaf, now you just consider this local system and you tensor over z with a definable structure sheaf of f. So essentially, you allow coefficients, which are definable holomorphic functions. So what is this again? This is the sheaf on the definable set of X, which on open sets is just Z, but then or is just C, excuse me, C, which has this gluing. And then this is the coherent sheaf, which is the same thing, but now we allow coefficients, which are definable holomorphic functions. <clears throat> so this is an element in particular of, of this category, because it's a, a coherent sheaf. Um, on the definable site. <clears throat> um, now the claim is that normally this is not going to be in the image of um, coherent sheaves of GM. <clears throat> so let's let's prove this. Suppose uh, v lambda tensor C O X def is in the image of coherent sheaves in GM. So it's algebraizable. Now, if you look at line bundles in GM, because this is a line bundle, it's, it's trivial over a small enough open sets. Um, there actually aren't any besides the trivial one. GM has no non-trivial line bundles algebraically. That's not very hard to show. And so if this were true, it would follow that V lambda tensor C O X def is trivial and therefore has a section. Right? <clears throat> so it would mean you can throw in definable holomorphic coefficients such that uh, you undo the monodromy. Now, what would the section have to be? The section would have to be a generating section of V lambda times E to the power of lambda log Q plus G of Q where this whole thing, so this f, is definable, and g is holomorphic on all of C star. It would have to be this, because this already undoes the monodromy. And once you undo the monodromy, you get an actual global section. It's got to be non-vanishing, so it's e to the power of something.
and this that's why I define it to be either the two pi i lambda because it's exactly oh, probably negative is what I want here because this exactly um, undoes the monodromy. <clears throat> okay, so why can't why can't this happen? I mean, it's not so surprising this can't happen most of the time. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Q is just the coordinate on on the Q is the coordinate on GM that I'm using. Yeah, the usual coordinate. Um, yeah. Okay, so suppose you have a definable f like this. Then what you can do is look at f prime over f. This would have to be definable as well. And what do you get? You get lambda over q g of q. Therefore, g of q is also definable and it's globally holomorphic, so this has to be a polynomial. So therefore, e to the power of lambda log q has to be definable. And so therefore, lambda has to be real. Just by looking at the real line, for example. Otherwise, you keep winding around infinitely often in terms of your angle. So if you pick lambda not real, you get a definable Cooper chief, which is not uh, algebraic. Any questions about the example? Hmm. Um, so we've been trying hard to figure out, sorry? Oh. We've been trying hard to figure out some category, some reasonable subcategory which is sort of understandable, but already line bundles seem extremely hard. So somehow understanding the category of coherent sheaves over here um, seems tricky in general. <clears throat> this has to do with the, our failure to sort of make a reasonable coherent cohomology theory that I was talking about uh, earlier, or the bow cohomology theory for definable analytic spaces. Even ones that sort of, you know, look pretty reasonable as in their definabilization of an algebraic variety, so you would expect them to be fairly global, but alas. Okay, um, so this shows that it's not subjective. Nonetheless, it has this nice property um, over here. So let me say something about the proof of um, this O minimal Gaga statement. But before I do, let me say something about some corollaries. So one corollary I already mentioned, if F is a coherent sheaf on X, then global sections of F are the same as global sections of the definabilization of F. Another corollary, and maybe the one we're most interested in, um, is the generalization of the definable Chow lemma to non-reduced spaces. So if you have, um, I can't, well, maybe I can. Nope, I can't. Uh, if you have uh, Y inside the definabilization of X, is a definable analytic subspace, de definable the closed definable analytic subspace, which means there's some cover on which Y is defined by the vanishing of some closed definable analytic functions. Then there exists some Z inside x, algebraic z inside x, with y just being the definabilization of z. <clears throat> so 
And how do you show this? Well, the point is coherent sheaves control everything, even definable analytic subspaces. So what you do is you look at the ideal sheaf of Y, the sheaf of all functions vanishing on Y inside um, OX def. Um, this is in the image of the definableization functor because the definableization of just the structure sheaf. Therefore, the subobject, this ideal sheaf, is also the definableization of a subobject. By the theorem, IY is the definableization of some I, where I sits inside OX, so it's an algebraic ideal sheaf. And now you just define Z to be the vanishing locus of this I. Moving on with the list of corollaries, you get this nice fact that if X uh, and Y are algebraic spaces, if X and Y are algebraic, and you have a map uh, between their definabilizations, then there exists a map between the extra algebraic spaces such that F is the definabilization of that map. And the proof is just, you look at the graph of this map. And now you apply the previous corollary to this graph. And finally, you get this uh, really nice result that um, a definable analytic space admits at most one algebraic structure. So there's most one algebraic structure you can put, one's a risky topology, and one sort of algebraic subsheaf uh, whose uh, definableization gives you a definable analytic space. And that follows immediately from this, because if you had two and an isomorphism between them, that isomorphism has to be algebraic. So if the identity map is a definable analytic isomorphism, it has to be an algebraic isomorphism as well. <clears throat> is something hard to read? Sorry. Oh. oh, like immediately, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, this is for coherent sheaves. So you got to say something a little bit extra, whereas this is for actual definable analytic spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, secretly it does. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this makes it so 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 I'll point out that um let's see, are any of these true for the analytic site? I think all of these are false for the analytic site instead of the definable analytic site. So if you have a an algebraic space that's not compact and you analytify it, then you have extra coherent sheaves with extra sections. Um you have closed analytic subspaces that aren't algebraic, you have maps that aren't algebraic between the analytifications. And of course, analytic spaces admit many different uh, algebraic structures in a variety of ways. Yeah, of course. So let me give an example of the last one in particular. <clears throat> but I want to say that like, it's, it's very convenient to have this corollary because now instead of looking for algebraic structures and wondering if you have the right one, analytic space algebraic. And if the answer is yes, you get a canonical algebraic structure on it. So counterexamples. examples. 
in the analytic category. So we have one, two, three, four corollaries here. Um, let me give counter examples to all of them. So for the first one, if you look at global sections on C for just the structure sheaf, the analytic structure sheaf, this contains but is much bigger than global sections of the algebraic structure sheaf. Because for example, this contains things like e to the z, right? Or whatever else. I mean, obviously much, much bigger. That's just polynomials over there. So likewise, why do you have more definable analytic spaces? You can just consider things like z equals e to the w. You know, there's many, many examples you can take. That's one of them. Um, so three, if you have, right. So if you have um, maps, then they're all algebraic. I mean, there's more interesting examples, but once again, you can look at Z goes to E to the Z as a map from C to C. And for many algebraic structures, um, you can do a couple of things actually. Uh, so let me give two counterexamples for this one. So the first counterexample, um, you can sort of copy this stuff. If you look at C squared, there's an analytic isomorphism, which, for example, sends ZW to ZW plus E to the Z. And this, in fact, gives you two definable algebraic structures in C squared, because you can take one algebraic structure and pull it back under this isomorphism, and you get another one. But OK, maybe that example looks a little convoluted. Um, So here is a, I don't know, perhaps less convoluted um, example. That's example one, A. And to get another example, what you can do is the following. You can let E be an elliptic curve. And you can let L be a um, non-trivial GA torsor over E. So L is uh, basically an affine uh, vibration over E. So L maps to E. And the fiber of L over any point E is canonically the line bundle corresponding to this point E minus zero. <clears throat> so it's basically the family of universal line, the universal line bundle um, over E. So again, what is this? This is something which has an action of C on it, but is not globally trivializable. Then it turns out analytically, if you look at LN, analytically, it's just C star squared. It's just GM squared. <clears throat> Whereas algebraically, it's obviously not, because this is affine, and this is the furthest thing from affine that you can imagine. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not super hard to see this. The point is you can uniformize this as C squared modulo a rank two lattice. And then if you just change coordinates, you can just make that rank to lattice your two basis vectors, and then you get GM squared. Um, so this isn't a super hard example to see. But it's a very different character to this, because these two varieties, L and GM squared, are, are, are different in, a, in, a, in many different ways. <clears throat> um, yeah, any, any questions about, about these examples?
So yeah, I'll, I'll point out that, of course, if you're dealing with compact stuff, all this is fine in the analytic category by, by Gaga. And in fact, it's, I mean, this is misleading to say, but it's a special case of, of everything here just by working in Rn because definable analytic spaces automatically make sense in Rn. Are definable in Rn. For the simple form? Yeah. The complex simple form. Yeah. You're saying that if you take an automobile, it's defined for it. Yeah. I don't get another algorithm. Absolutely, yeah. So if you take any if any automorphism, which is not algebraic, then given one algebraic structure, you can just pull it back by this automorphism and get another algebraic structure. I was just wondering if you take some algebraic uh, sorry, some definable automorphism. Oh, either that is not definable. Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, you're fully correct. This is not legal because either the Z is not. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I, I retract my previous apology. Um, it is analytic. This is an analytic kind of example. Yeah. Yes, of course. If you take a definable anamorphism, it is algebraic. That's the point of this corollary. Any definable map between definableizations of algebraic spaces has to be algebraic. Yeah, that's kind of the point of the, the result. Absolutely. And that's, that's really what you want to show. If you want to show you have one algebraic structure, it's secretly the same thing as showing that automorphisms are the same in the definable world or the, or the algebraic world. 100%. Other questions? All right. So um, let me take about 20 minutes to uh, not prove the result in detail, but explain the kind of, uh, kind of reductions you use to prove the result, uh, what sort of goes into it. And once you have the stuff we did last time with, with coherence, um, it's really just a matter of sort of assembling the argument in the right order. Um, so proof of O minimal Gaga. Um, so what we're going to use is, again, we have these two functors, we have definableization, and we have analytification between the algebraic world, the definable analytic world, and the analytic world. And the composite here is the functor that's usually studied, the capital A analytification functor. So first you observe that what we already know, this is from previous, just from studying analyticians, is that this functor here, skipping this category altogether, is uh, exact and faithful. So it preserves exact sequences. And you don't have this isomorphism, but you do have an injection from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Two algebraic maps can suddenly become the same analytically, <clears throat> is exact and faithful. We know that def, the definableization functor, is um, exact and faithful. Sorry, is, is exact. Uh, we did this on stocks. Uh, and therefore, we conclude the def has to be faithful because if you had two maps here which became the same here they would still be the same over here and so we have the exactness and the faithfulness part of one we're missing the full of course we don't yet know that <clears throat> so the second observation is to get the fullness we're really going to uh, use two to deduce that. Once you know the essential image is closed undertaking sub object, you get this fullness. So two 
implies one. And to see that, suppose you have a map F between the definabilizations of two coherent sheaves. Then once again, you use this graph trick to get a, to identify it with its graph. So with a coherent subsheaf of direct sum, two implies that the graph is algebraic. And you're done because the graph is algebraic and it must come from the graph some algebraic map. So the important part is really showing two, and really all you got to show is sub objects because a quotient is just your thing modulo a sub object. If they're both algebraic, then you're exact, and so the quotient algebraic as well. So the whole point is showing that um, sub objects are good. Now, there are two reasons um, that this is basically two things that this statement has over the definable child theorem of Peter Zion Serchenko, which we very much use, by the way. This is not like a reproving of more in a different way. We're upgrading a known result. Um, the, the two extra ingredients here are as follows. <clears throat> First of all, we consider arbitrary coherent sheaves instead of just like the structure sheaf, like they do, or vector bundles, for example. Um, and secondly, we consider X's which might not be reduced, which might have some nilpotent structure. That was our original motivation for studying this category. So let's first deal with that second bit, dealing with nilpotent structures. And so the setable study is the following. Suppose that X is a um, algebraic space with some nilpotent structure. I in OX is some ideal sheaf. And let's assume that um, I squared is equal to zero. <clears throat> this is the sort of usual setup you use. And we'll let X naught be the zero locus of I. So that the point set of X naught is the same as the point set of X, even though the, uh, the sheaves are very different. So for example, X could be like the X axis, but thickened. X could be given by like the vanishing of Y squared, in which case I would be the ideal sheaf generated by Y. And x naught is the usual x axis. Let's say this is all taking place in c squared, vanishing by y. So the points here are the same, but here you have this infinitesimal y floating around, and here you don't. <clears throat> okay. And the idea is to reduce the statement uh, on x, reduce two on x to two on this x naught. So you want to show if you have it on x naught, you have it on x. And essentially, you want to understand coherent sheaves here by understanding them here. So, suppose that you have some um, definable sub definable coherent subsheaf E inside the definabilization of a coherent sheaf F on X. We want to show that if we know the statement for x naught, then this E is also algebraic. <clears throat> okay. What we're going to do is break up our sheaves on x into sheaves and x naught in the following way. So we have zero goes to if 
goes to f goes to f mod i f, a sort of a, a trivial exact sequence. And we're interested in the definable categories. We're going to definableize all of these guys. We'll consider them all as definable sheaves, as, as sheaves on the um, definableization of x. And now here we have e goes here. We have i times e inside of it. And we have the quotient of e by i times e. So we have an exact sequence like this. And we have maps like this. So we have this kind of diagram, sorry? sorry. We have this kind of diagram. And we want to show that this guy is algebraic. <clears throat> OK, now. Note that these sheaves, the two on the extremes, are naturally coherent sheaves on x naught because they're killed by i. That one is by definition, because you're quotienting out by i times itself. And this one is because i squared is 0. So if I hit this by i, I get i squared times e, which is 0. So being killed by i means that you live on the 0 locus of i, and that's x naught. So these are naturally sheaves on x naught. Uh, x naught definableization, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and they're sitting inside algebraic sheaves, definableizations of algebraic sheaves. Therefore, by induction, by the statement for x naught, these are algebraic. <clears throat> so we're trying to show that the statement for x naught implies the statement for x. Um, yeah, so I'm a, sorry, I should have written it down. <laughs> I should have written it down, yeah. Assume theorem for x naught. The idea is to reduce to the case of reduced spaces first. Okay. Yeah. So you can make an induction statement on like the order of no potents or whatever, but this is really what's going on. <clears throat> um, these are algebraic. So now um, we, can, we want to show that um, E is algebraic. Let's call these maps something. Let's call them like, uh, let's call this map pi um, or, or, or whatever. So now what we can do is we can replace f by f mod uh, i times, uh, i def times e. <clears throat> and we can also replace f by the pre-image of, um, of, of zero here, by the pre-image of, uh, sorry, we can replace f by this, by, uh, apologies, one, one second, one second, replace it by this. And now we want to replace it, ah, yes, by the pre-image. Of these sheaves. And essentially, I want to reduce the case where both of these are zero. So once I know these are algebraic, I can take the quotient of f by this guy and the pre image of f under this map by this guy. And that reduces the problem to the case where both of those are zero. Or rather, we reduce to the case where i def e is 0 and f mod i f definableized is naturally is isomorphic to e mod i def e. <clears throat> so we can make this guy 0 and this map here an isomorphism. 
So in that case, what is E? This E is just a section of this map pi. E is a section F mod I of definable I maps to F def. Because this maps an isomorphism. And so we just have a lift of it. <clears throat> so it's enough to show any map like this is algebraic. But this is killed by I. Phi, in fact, lands Uh, sorry, not in here, but the part that's killed by I in F I torsion definableized. <clears throat> okay, so now we have a map between two things killed by I. So these are both coherent sheaves on X naught. And so therefore, phi is algebraic by our hypothesis. because everything works fine on X naught. <clears throat> so again, we break it up like this, using this ideal sheaf I, the other two are algebraic by induction. Then we can reduce to the case where that guy is zero by replacing F by this quotient, and where this maps an isomorphism by replacing F by this pre-image. Then what is this E? Well, it's something inside F which maps isomorphically to that quotient. So it's just the image of a map like this. Both of any map like this has to land in the I torsion of F, because this is all I torsion. And then you get a map between two I torsion things, so they exist in X naught, and therefore it has to be algebraic by the hypothesis. <clears throat> so that's the reduction uh, from X to X naught. Okay, so now using this reduction, we assume X is reduced. So it's got no new potence on it. Everything's determined by functions at this point. <clears throat> so now there's two more cases. So first of all, if E, F, and the quotients are vector bundles, F def mod E, the case where everything's really locally free. Then what's happening here? Well, a vector bundle E uh, inside F is determined by sort of what the slope of it is. And so if we have a vector bundle in X, epsilon is determined as a section of some appropriate Grassmannian of F over X, because to give you a vector bundle, I just got to give you a slope. There's some Grassmannian space parameterizing all of those guys. And so this case follows from definable Chow. Essentially, if I have a vector bundle, you can think of it as trivial, so like OX squared or OX to the N, and then giving you a subvector bundle is basically giving you a family of functions. And now because we're reduced, we really do have global functions on X, and definable child will tell you they're algebraic. This is the kind of argument that Peter Zoom and Serchenko have floating all over their paper. This sort of observation is, uh, is very common in their methods. <clears throat> And so now we're almost done. We can basically reduce 
to the case where we just have vector bundles in the following way. So in general, there is an open dense U in X where the above is true, where E F F mod E, F def mod E, excuse me, are all vector bundles. Just because that's how coherent sheaves um, work. <clears throat> so there's some open set where everything um, looks very good. And so over that open set, we can algebraize EU and write it as a definabilization of some coherent sheaf EU. <clears throat> but now the whole point, the whole point is this gluing. We want to figure out how it extends from U to the complement of U. So Z is like a closed subvariety of X. U is an open subset of X. Over U, everything's fine. Now I want to figure out the extension over the Z, the creep um, is also algebraic. So we finally have the following um, kind of cool trick. We let EU bar in F be the closure of EU. So um, formally speaking, EU bar sits inside EU. Um, it, it sits inside F. And they both sit inside the push forward of the pullback of F to U. This is the formal definition. But basically, it's all sections in F that you can reach by taking a section of EU over U and closing it up. So you have some coherent sheaf you can make from EU in an algebraic way. So not, not sweating the details there. And finally, you have this very nice point, which is now, if we compare EU def, uh, sorry, EU, EU closure def and their original E, then these are the same outside of Z. On U, nothing's changed. This is still the algebraization of this. And so finally, by definable Nostellensatz, The difference between them, i.e. the quotient, is killed by some power of the, uh, of the ideal sheaf of Z. <clears throat> and so now you're reduced to studying things happening on the vanishing of this ideal sheaf. So it's not reduced anymore, but it's smaller dimension. And so once again, now you're done by induction. So I'm going, I'm going kind of quick, but I just want to explain the sort of gist of the argument. Uh, sorry, I'm going to run 30 seconds over, which is that you first go from the non-reduced case to the reduced case. Then the vector bundle case is definable chow. And in general, you're a vector bundle away from a closed subset. Nullstellensatz, definable Nullstellensatz, allows you to measure the difference on some thickening of that closed subset. And now you're a lower dimension and you induct. OK, thank you very much. Apologies for going slightly over. Um, any questions? <laughs>